Madeline Smith, or Madeline Hamilton Smith, now or lately prisoner in the prison of Glasgow. You are indicted and accused at the instance of James Moncrief Esquire, Her Majesty's advocate for Her Majesty's interest. The year is 1857, and 21 year old Madeline Smith is on trial in Court 3 at the Crown Court in Edinburgh. She stands accused of murdering her lover, Pierre Emile Langelier, by poisoning him. I went into the bedroom and found him dead. He was lying on his right side, with his back towards the light, his knees a little drawn up, one arm outside the bedclothes and another in. Emile Langelier died on Monday the 23rd of March. Dr Stephen, who found him, along with three other experts, undertook two separate post-mortem examinations. The appearance of the mucous membrane taken in connection with the history as related to us by witnesses, being such as, in our opinion, justified a suspicion of death having resulted from poison. You can hear the post-mortem examinations being discussed in detail by our excellent pathologist, Dr Richard Shepherd, in episode four. Here in episode five of Inside Forensic Science, the case of Madeline Smith, a podcast from the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee, we're turning to the subject of toxicology. On day two of Madeline Smith's trial, Dr Frederick Penny, the man who did the chemical analysis of the samples taken during the post-mortem, was called to give evidence for the prosecution. Penny was a chemist, a recently elected fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and highly respected forensic scientist. Dr Frederick Penny, I have carefully analysed and chemically examined the said stomach and its contents with a view to ascertain whether they contained any poisonous substance. My name is Neave McDade. I'm a professor of forensic science at the University of Dundee, and I am the director of the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee. What was interesting was the use of the scientists from the universities to do both the pathology work and the toxicology analysis. And again, back in those days, that was how things happened. The, the expertise around forensic medicine was in the universities in Scotland. It remains, actually, in the universities in Scotland. But the toxicology expertise has moved out of the universities and into more mainstream forensic science work. So there was, there was an interest in just looking at how and where the expertise was drawn from back in 1857 and where it will be drawn from today. I'm Dr Lorna Nisbet. I am a senior lecturer and principal investigator at LRCFS at the University of Dundee. Let's talk about forensic toxicology. Explain to me, what is forensic toxicology? What does a toxicologist do? So forensic toxicology is the study of poisons, toxins, drugs um, within organisms. So I'm not just going to say in people because some forensic toxicology happens, for example, with horse race doping, for example. And it's always got, or because it's got forensics, it should have some sort of legal slant to it. And what, what we do depends on, obviously, the case that we're looking at. So if we're looking at post-mortem, we're trying to help the pathologist see cause of death. We can never see cause of death as toxicologists. That's not within our scope. Um, it's not within our speciality. But what we can do is we can obviously provide that information. But we can also be looking at things that are anti-mortem. So we can look at drug driving and drink driving. We can look at child custody cases, for example. There's also human performance testing if we think that there's been some sort of sports doping, either um, in human sport or in animal sport. And also it can kind of stretch into environmental toxicology as well a little bit, depending on if we think that there's been a, a crime there too. OK, so let's turn to this, this case... Stripping it right back, what are the key questions that need to be asked as a forensic toxicologist when it comes to poisoning? What, what's your starting point? So the first thing that we want to do is we want to identify if there's been a poison there. Um, so we want to see, is there a poison? Is there something that might have contributed to death? And then if possible and if appropriate, we'll want to quantify. So we'll want to determine how much of that poison is there. So that's really kind of where we would put it. Because toxicology has moved on significantly and because we are much, much more sensitive, actually interpretation of what those results mean isn't as common at anymore if we look at a lot of the scientific guidelines for toxicologists we're kind of told to not 
back calculate or to try and identify how much somebody took. It's a, that's a really, really complex, complex thing to do. Um, and it's a lot of kind of just surmising. So we tend to not do that as much anymore. But that's, that's what we want to do. We want to identify if something's there and we want to identify how much. We're going to park the how much question for the moment, although it is important to this case, and focus on the what. As you'll be aware from the post-mortem episode, the what, in this case, is arsenic. But how do we know it's arsenic that poisoned Emile Langelier? Back in court three, Dr Penny described his findings from an analysis of the contents of Langelier's stomach. On being allowed to repose, it deposited a white powder, which was found on examination to possess the external characters and all the chemical properties peculiar to Arsenius acid. That is, the common white arsenic of the shops. It consisted of hard, gritty, transparent, colourless, crystalline particles. It was soluble in boiling water and readily dissolved in a solution of caustic potash. It was unchanged by sulphide of ammonium and volatilised when heated on platina foil. So what they, they started off with was a number of what we call colorimetric tests. And these are tests where we're adding lots of different chemicals together to try and get different colors to be formed. Now, what that does is it tries to kind of indicate if there's a class of drugs there or a group of drugs there um, or a specific metals or, or something there that shouldn't be. So we're trying to see if, if there could be a reaction that happens and then what that reaction and what that colour is will try and help us kind of narrow down what could be present. If you think about the amount of compounds that are in the world, if we think about the amount of things that people at this point in time could have been exposed to, there is a whole range. So we have to really, in that almost haystack-like um, approach, try and narrow that down as much as we possibly can. So that's been the kind of first steps that they've taken. A small portion of the powder was also subjected to what is commonly known as Marsh's process, and metallic arsenic was thus obtained, with all its peculiar physical and chemical properties. They've then seen that it's kind of indicative of arsenic, and then they've conducted the test, which is the Marsh test, which was very common at the time. So it had also recently been used in several other high profile cases, a couple, like 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago before then. Um, so it really was the kind of gold standard for arsenic testing at the time. And so what they did for that was they had um, a sample that they had from the person that they suspect has been poisoned and they placed that in a flask uh, with arsenic-free zinc and then they add sulfuric acid. This creates a gas and then that goes through a drying tube to another glass tube where that's heated and then that arsenic is deposited and that deposits as a kind of mirror. So basically what they're seeing is the arsenic being drawn out from the sample and it's visually appearing. In Dr Penny's evidence, he went on to say he found arsenic not only in Langelier's stomach, but in his small intestine, large intestine, liver, brain, heart and lungs. The key question is, how did it get there? There are a couple of quite challenging questions around whether this was murder or whether this was self-inflicted. And, and that's the first big pertinent question. Um, the medical evidence may not provide the answer to that because if if what has occurred is a meal has taken a large dose of arsenic, then the medical evidence to demonstrate that will not be different because that's about did you take arsenic or did you not? And the medical evidence that will survive as a consequence of taking that particular poison. So then it becomes who administered it. So that becomes the salient question. And that's not something that in this case the medical evidence can answer because there wasn't trauma to the body, there wasn't you know, other evidence of, of a, a violent attack or anything like that where medical evidence can help us in determining the, the cause of death or indeed what had gone on beforehand. And so here the medical evidence is, is, is solely saying was this arsenic, was it not? It can perhaps give some information about dosage, but that the, the aspect of how did that arsenic get into the body then becomes a matter that's relating primarily to where did the arsenic come from? Do we have evidence of purchase? If that arsenic that was purchased, was that the same as the arsenic that was administered? That then becomes the critical question. Lots to unpack and unpick there from Neve. 
Let's look at where the arsenic might have come from and whether we have evidence of purchase. George Murdoch. I am a partner in the firm of Murdoch Brothers, druggists, Sochi Hall Street. We keep a registry book of the poisons sold by us, which I now identify. In it is entered all the arsenic we sell by retail. Under date 21st February, we have an entry. February 21st, Miss Smith, 7 Blythewood Square, sixpence worth of arsenic for garden and country house, M. H. Smith. This is also initialed by me. I recollect that purchase being made. It was made by Miss Smith herself. George Carruthers Halliburton. I am assistant to Mr. Curry, chemist, Socky Hall Street. I identify our registry book for the sale of poisons. Under date 6th March 1857, I see an entry. March 6, Miss Smith, 7 Blythewood Square, arsenic, 1 ounce, kill rats. I signed it and it is also signed M. H. Smith. In the registry book, number 186, there is also an entry under date 18th March. There are no other entries this year except in these two. That entry is Miss Smith, 7 Blythewood Square, arsenic, 1 ounce, to kill rats. So arsenic was commonly used for rat poison um, and until they changed the legislation to bring in um, effectively the arsenic law where you had to colour it and you couldn't sell it to children anymore, which is always a good thing, um, it was very, very common and it was very commonly sold. And there were reports in kind of House of Lords and Parliament about just how readily available arsenic was. And I think it is quite frightening to think of children um, being able to go in and say, I'll have four sweets and something else and, oh yeah, can I get some arsenic please too? So obviously that, that, did, that did shift. But it was still commonly used as rat poison, although it was limited and it was kind of coloured and whatnot to try and prevent these accidental overdoses. But it was also available in a wide range of things and it was prescribed as well for a wide range of it will cure for lots of different things. So there was plenty of legitimate reasons as to why you would have arsenic in your house. And obviously in 1850s, saying you've got a rat infestation isn't going to be that uncommon either. So a lot of people did did have it for at least that purpose, which was what was stated. And one of the things it was it was used for was um, to make your, your complexion paler. Eleanor Gordon, author and affiliate professor in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Glasgow. Because, of course, at that time, uh, to have a tanned complexion was a kind of sign that you were of the lower orders, that you had to be out in the sun to work. So it was very, very attractive to the paler your skin was, the better. And arsenic was one of the things that they, they, they used to to make it paler, and as well as, as I say, a pesticide. I mean, when Madeline brought her arsenic at the chemist, she said it was to um, kill rats. Would it have been surprising that someone of her class was out buying arsenic? Not really, if um, if you know that it's 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 used uh, in makeup, you know. Um, I mean, she wasn't that. Dis I mean, she wasn't hiding the fact that she was going no, out and buying no, it, exactly. was it? I mean, it wasn't a. I mean, she was quite open about it. I just yeah. thought, hmm, I wonder if that would have been looked on as surprising, but maybe Well, not. again, I think that comes from the, the kind of stereotypical view we have of the Victorians as, you know, and that class anyway, you know. As, I mean, I told you she would walk up certain down Sucky Hall Street, just sort of being seen and seeing, you know, and going out shopping at seven or eight at night was not uncommon. Madeline admitted she had bought arsenic on several occasions, but in spite of what she told the chemists when she bought it, in her court declaration, she claimed it was for use as a cosmetic. I have bought arsenic on various occasions. I used it all as a cosmetic and applied it to my face, neck and arms, diluted with water. James Girdwood. I am a surgeon in Falkirk and have been about 40 years in practice. I have frequently 
since the publication of an article in Chambers Journal, been asked by females as to the use of arsenic as a cosmetic. That is about two years ago. Many of my friends consulted me and I told them it would be highly injurious and ought not to be taken. Where have we got to? So, there's evidence that Madeleine bought arsenic and there's evidence that L'Angelier had arsenic in his system. The prosecution suggested that Madeleine had given L'Angelier the arsenic in a cup of hot chocolate. Again, Madeleine doesn't deny having given Emile hot chocolate. But is there any evidence that Madeleine put arsenic in it? Is there any way to link the arsenic bought in the two chemist shops to the arsenic found in L'Angelier's stomach? And wouldn't L'Angelier have noticed arsenic in his cocoa while he's busy wooing Madeleine if that's what happened? So many questions. Before we try and answer some of them, let's turn back to the question of dose and a toxicology history lesson from Lorna Nisbet. It started off with a guy called Paracelsus, and he was a philosopher. Um, I think he's 15th century, I should know. Um, and his slogan is, the dose makes the poison. So you can always you know, identify a proper toxicologist because half of us all have these tattoos that say the dose makes the poison on us somewhere. But it's a really relevant point. Um, and it's basically you know, reminding people that if you take enough of a certain thing, it, it will eventually have a negative impact on you. And we've seen that with people that have, you know, effectively overdosed because they've drank too much water. So it's a really key thing. And then we have, um, from the kind of 1840s-esque, a, a pathologist called Orphelia. And he was really actually instrumental when it comes to getting the Marsh test, which has been used in this case, widespread um, and really publicising that, um, which actually helped with the reduction in arsenic cases because suddenly, oh, this can get tested for and this can um, we can now identify you and we can hunt you down if you have used this. So again, he started to identify that when he was doing his postmortems, if somebody had taken something in and there was something that, you know, had poisoned them, that they would start to see markings on the organs themselves or, or the liver, etc. And that really started to kind of kick off the field more of just like a kind of more than just a philosophical aspect. So if the dose makes the poison, what kind of dose are we talking about in the case of Emile Langelier? I made in the last place a careful determination of the quantity of arsenic contained in the said stomach and its contents. A stream of sulfuretted hydrogen gas was transmitted through a known quantity of the prepared fluids from the said matters until the whole of the arsenic was precipitated in the form of trisulfide of arsenic. This sulfide, after being carefully purified, was collected, dried and weighed. Its weight corresponded to a quantity of arsenious acid, commonly white arsenic, in the entire stomach and its contents, equal to 82 grains and 7 tenths of a grain, or to a very nearly one fifth of an ounce. 82 and 7 tenths grains, which is, you know, I, I, we don't work in grains anymore, but I calculate that to be about five and a half grams of arsenic found in his stomach. Pathologist Dr. Richard Shepherd. Five and a half grams. I mean, you know, that's, that's a good teaspoon full, that sort of size. I mean, it's difficult to equate. So, but, you know, it, it, it is a, a lot of the arsenics are, they don't, they taste less. So, you know, you, he, he, if it's put into food or however it's taken. But it, I'm struck actually by the size of the dose. Something really quite concentrated has got in through his mouth and into his stomach. And as you say, he's been purging, he's been vomiting, so this probably doesn't represent the totality. And we also know there's more in his small bowel and his large bowel and distributed around his body. So this is, this is massive overdose. Quantities were quite important here. Yes. And they, they refer to it a lot. So how are quantities determined? Because even in reading the stuff, it seems to be something of a dark art. Yeah. So here it is a bit of a dark art. 
And I also question the value of putting a quantity on what they've managed to recover from the stomach. So we typically wouldn't quantify um, stomach contents to determine how much is there. Because what we're trying to do is what we want to know is how much arsenic was in that person's body and circulating freely in that body at their time of death. That will tell us, you know, what was the concentration that was in their blood, what was going to all those different organs. And that's much more comparable than what is sitting in a stomach ready to be di dispersed into those other organs. So just because this individual appears to have had between five and six grams of arsenic in their stomach, that's not actually telling us what's in circulation in their body, if that hopefully makes sense. And so really the value of putting a quantity on that, I question as to what what forensic evidence and what that's actually added to the case, really, apart from telling us obviously that the individual took a, a large quantity of arsenic, it's not really telling us about what was in their body. How much arsenic would destroy life? It's not easy to give a precise answer to that question. Cases are on record in which life was destroyed by two and four grains, four or six grains, are generally regarded as sufficient to destroy life. And the amount I determined as existing in the stomach was 82 grains. So how did all that arsenic get into Pierre-Emile Langelier? The prosecution suggested that Madeleine Smith had put the arsenic in a cup of cocoa. It's odourless and tasteless, so in many respects, a perfect drug for spiking. But it doesn't dissolve readily, as the trial heard from Dr Douglas McLagan, who was called on to give evidence for the defence. In order to make boiling water a sufficient solvent of arsenic, you must continue the boiling of the arsenic for a considerable time. If you want to dissolve a pretty large quantity of arsenic, you require to boil it violently for half an hour. Would Madeline have known how to dissolve all that arsenic in the cocoa? Would she have had the means to boil it violently for half an hour? Do we even know for sure that cocoa was how the arsenic was ingested? I asked Richard Shepherd whether modern pathology practices would be able to shed light on how exactly a poison got into the body. It's always very difficult to know exactly how these poisons are delivered and actually modern pathology practice, we, we seldom deal with poisons like this. Do you know what I mean? P people will take overdoses of drugs and then you may find tablets, you may find tablet residue in the stomach. But you know, th these sort of poisons are now so carefully controlled that it can be difficult to establish how they were uh, um, delivered. But what we would do now is I'm sure we would also look at the stomach contents for food debris, for evidence, if it's in evidence of um, cocoa or chocolate, we will be looking for the vehicle that was also present in the stomach as well as the drug itself. And so I think we would work somewhat harder to understand what had gone on. However, with the purging, with all of the other effects, we may not be successful, but we would certainly spend time trying to look. And I think there would also have been a, a significant search of his, his residence and his property to see, you know, were there any chocolate, was there any chocolate or a cup that still contained residues that might also contain arsenic? So the, the search around him would have been important too. Which brings us back to the issue of context, which was something we looked at in detail in episode three. You can't look at any of this evidence in isolation. Certainly for contemporary forensic scientists, the cup of cocoa and its residues would provide further avenues to investigate, particularly with regard to DNA and fingerprints. But just because we have more sophisticated tools available to us doesn't mean this case would have been clear cut. Neve McDade again. In this case, if we had recovered um, Emile's fingerprints and... Madeline's fingerprints from the cup that was shown to contain the arsenic. What does that actually mean? Um, it might seem very um, important evidence, but if both of them had, a, had a, a previous history, then you would expect both fingerprints to be on the cup anyway. Same with DNA. So the DNA evidence, the finding of Madeline's DNA on the cup that was 
uh, that was used to house the poison or to contain the poison might not mean anything because it was in her house. So context for the interpretation and evaluation of evidence is critically important. Um, from a scientific perspective, the data doesn't change. So we still found arsenic, we still found it in this cup, and this cup had cocoa in it, so we found all of those things. But the context within which that is placed, um, did the cocoa come from a meal or did the cocoa come from Madeleine, becomes important. Let's turn back to the arsenic to see if we can answer that question. The arsenic Madeleine bought from the two different chemist shops was coloured. Curry's arsenic by indigo and Murdoch's by soot. Dr Frederick Penny, the Professor of Chemistry from the Andersonian Institute, carried out an experiment. He gave Murdoch's arsenic, coloured with soot, to a dog and then looked to see if he could detect the soot in the dog's stomach, which he could. So, did the experts involved in analysing Emile Langelier's stomach find any evidence of indigo or soot? Would that link the arsenic found in Emile to the arsenic Madeleine bought? Dr Robert Christensen, physician, Murray Place, Edinburgh. I did not detect colouring matter in the dead body. My attention was not directed to it. I got only one article in which it might have been found if my attention had been directed to it, the contents of the small intestine. The others had been subjected to previous preparation. I was not asked to attend to colouring matter. I did not see it and I did not search for it. Supposing soot or indigo to have been administered with the arsenic, I think it might have been found in the stomach. I can't say it would have been found even by careful examination. Many circumstances go to the possibility of its being found. Many of the component parts of soot are insoluble and it might have been partially removed by frequent vomiting, but not entirely. It is very difficult to remove soot from arsenic entirely. Indigo would have been found more easily from the peculiarity of the colour and the chemical properties being so precise. The toxicologists in the Madeleine Smith case didn't look for soot or indigo. Surely a significant mistake on their part. Richard Shepherd believes so. For me, if they had found soot, it would have pointed to one chemist shop. And if they'd found indigo, it would have pointed to another chemist shop. And that would have enabled them to focus their investigations on a particular shop. I mean, you know, Madeline is said to have bought arsenic on a number of occasions. And I noticed that she's said to have misrepresented herself whilst buying it, which is you know, really quite suspicious that she's not just buying it openly, she's, she's buying it and misrepresenting herself. So it would have allowed them to focus their investigation as to where it had come from. But it, it may well be that each shop had its own little foible, that some shops didn't sell it with soot or with indigo. Some shops just sold it as rat poison or ant poison quite openly without any concern at all. So it may well be that at that time they said, well, we, you know, we can spend a lot of time doing this, but it's, in the end, everyone puts soot in it or everyone puts indigo in it and it's not going to help us. According to Lorna Nisbet, even if they had found soot, that wouldn't have necessarily pointed to the source. If you had a good defence lawyer um, and, and somebody you know, who was really switched on, there's no reason to say that that soot hasn't just originated through either something else that they've eaten in their diet or that it's came from just kind of exposure to the environment, right? So we can kind of rule that out. The coloured one, they say they stated you know, it wasn't present because they didn't see colour in the stomach contents. Stomach contents aren't particularly nice looking things. So we're not going to see a bright blue stomach just because we've put blue, um, like something blue in the stomach. So I think that would be quite difficult. And then again, you would have to prove that at no point did he ingest anything that didn't also contain that dye, which makes it much, much more difficult. What we could have done though, is if the, say for example, um, there had been something, a container that she'd had, you know, if she'd, if she'd put some of the arsenic into a container or into a cup or um, if there was any residue, we'd be able to compare that to what we found um, from each of the different shops. And that would help us because that's not gone through the chemo, it's not gone into the body. There's no way that it's necessarily been 
um, been altered by the body. So it would be, it's much easier to kind of compare batches before they go into the body. And that's what we do as, um, that would be more of a kind of forensic chemist who would do that. And we do that with compounds like um, amphetamine, for example, and we can work out how they've been synthesised and what route they've been synthesised and we can try and link batches. But even that's quite difficult in itself because who's to say that Madeline, when she was making up her batch, she's mixed it with cocoa powder, that's then changed changed what ha she had. You know, that's not... If we think about it as, as almost like drug smuggling now, every time it goes down the the kind of chain of command, something's added in. So how do you then link that back to the very, very original when it doesn't really look like that anymore? Um, so trying to do that is much, much more difficult. So even with the more advanced analytical tools available to the toxicologist today, it might have been very difficult to determine whether the poison that killed Emile Langelier came from Madeleine. It's clear if you go and read through all the evidence from the expert witnesses in the case, and we've put a link to the trial papers in our episode notes if you want to do just that, there was very little cross-examination. And I wondered what Donald Finlay KC made of it. There was virtually no cross-examination of the experts. Uh, partly, I think, out of reverence or respect. Partly because why, why would you want to know about science and technology? That wasn't, you know. Um, there's no doubt when I first started, senior police officers and others from other professions were perhaps cross-examined, but it was done very respectfully. Uh, and then a rough boy like me came along uh, and began to suggest that, no, they might not be possibly, well, I, I do apologise, but could you maybe be mistaken? Uh, but it was put to them quite firmly that this was just a pack of lies and they'd made this up. <laughs> and it was obvious it was a pack of lies and they'd made it up. Um, uh, and the same with experts, we, we, we challenged them. Uh, they used to give evidence on blood groups uh, and say, uh, before DNA, I think it was a finger of they would come up with the best grouping was about 1 in 137 of the population. And that was everybody went, oh, wow, 137. Uh, and I used to say, well, how many people live in Glasgow? Well, I don't know. Well, why don't you know? Because you've got to, you've got to know how many, how many people in Glasgow have that blood grouping. So we, and we started to challenge them on that. And they responded by coming into court with the statistics. And, and, and the, the game, if you like, began to change because cross-examination was, was, was much more challenging and, at times, aggressive. So it, it was a very different attitude. And if the trial were conducted by today's standards and against today's background, it would be much more competitive than it was back then. No doubt about that. Whether the outcome would have been any different, of course, is anybody's guess. Just occurred to me, Neve. I mean, we... We're doing this series and, and what we do is we look back and we see how science has evolved um, since the case in point, which in this case, Madeleine Smith um, in 1857. Of course, the other thing that's evolving is the knowledge of your jury over that period of time. So if we're sitting listening to this and looking at this evidence now as a jury and, and, and lay people, and I'm going to sit on that side of this camp, um, we're, much, we're much more used to the idea... I suspect, of science and what it can offer up, then that jury may have been back in Madeleine's time. So I wonder whether context comes into this again in terms of communicating science in, in that this was a different era of a different time and understandings of science may be quite different to if you've got a jury now hearing this same kind of evidence. I think that's a really, again, really good point. Uh, I, I, w I would say that it's not always a positive thing that we know um, more about science, particularly in the context of criminal investigations, because some of what we, um, we, we know and we might have expectations of if we're members of the jury may simply be incorrect. And one example, uh, for example, is if a case doesn't have DNA evidence in it, and this one most likely would not have had for the reasons we've already said, because there's familiarity between the two individuals, um, if the case doesn't have DNA evidence, then there is some anecdotal research to suggest that that means juries are less likely to think 
that the prosecution has got a case because, well, everything has DNA evidence in it, doesn't it? And so, so there's, there's that aspect uh, and, and that becomes important and it may, have, may be that in a case like this, the prosecutor, as they stand up to start their case, may say, there isn't any DNA in this case and this is why. Because there's an expectation that you'll always have DNA and DNA is, is, is always pertinent to every case and, it, and it's simply not true. So it, it's almost a little knowledge is a dangerous thing is where we're, we're getting to. That's not to say that increased scientific literacy, and we certainly have that, I think, across society, is not a bad thing. Of course it's a good thing. But it is equally about managing the expectation that in every case you're going to get all the bells and whistles because in every case you won't. So what's pertinent to this case now about the identification of the poison that was used and then about determining actually how did it get to where it was in order for the individual to drink it and it therefore to cause the death becomes the pertinent issue. And that wouldn't be enormously different. The techniques would be more sophisticated. The Our ability to test for arsenic is m absolutely more sophisticated. Um, that so that a sophistication would, would exist, but the pertinent question is still the same here in this particular case, I think, which is, which is around how did the poison get into the cocoa cup. So did Madeline do it or was it suicide? Opinions are divided. To kill someone, you have to give them about two or three hundred milligrams of arsenic. He's been given five and a half thousand milligrams of arsenic. This is a massive quantity. How do you get that much into someone, even in cocoa or chocolates or, or, or whatever? And, and if, if I was pushed down and I had to make a decision, I would say that points to me rather more towards suicide, a deliberate ingestion of this amount, than managing to slip it into food. There's easier ways of doing it. Why would you slowly kill yourself and die in agony? Suicides, I say, don't, don't leave messages and sit and wait and being rescued. That, these are cries for help. This was no cry for help. This was a man who inflicted upon himself a long and lingering death. I don't buy that. Because he wasn't that kind of a man. He was a fairly cowardly individual. In the next and final episode of this series of Inside Forensic Science, The Case of Madeline Smith, we're going to turn to the verdict. Gentlemen of the jury, it is necessary that you remember that the case is to be tried and decided solely on the evidence. In episode five of Inside Forensic Science, the case of Madeline Smith, the actors were Joe Riley, Alan Richardson, Russell Mullen, John Harding, David Stewart, Alan McDermott, Ian Boffey, and Dan Holland. The experts were Professor Neve McDade, Dr. Richard Shepherd, Professor Eleanor Gordon, Dr. Lorna Nisbet, and Donald Finley KC. The series story consultants are Heather Duran and Clara Morris and it's written and presented by me, Penny Stewart. Inside Forensic Science is produced by Adventurous Audio Limited for the Leverhulme Research Centre for Forensic Science at the University of Dundee and is funded by the Leverhulme Trust. <laughs>